Hello and welcome to the Software Engineering Unlocked podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Michaela, and today I have the pleasure to talk to Dr. Feline Hermans. Feline is an associate professor at the University of Leiden and investigates how we can best learn how to program. Feline is also active in the developer community and organizes several developer meetups and conferences. She's a big fan of Lego and served for many years as a Lego judge at local competitions for kids. Her passion for bringing young kids into tech also leads her to being a teacher at a high school in the Netherlands. Currently, Feline also writes a book called The Programmer's Brain, explaining what happens in our brain when we learn to code, but also when we read and write and try to understand code. So I'm super thrilled to have Feline here with me. Feline, welcome to my show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really, really happy. It took quite some time, but now you are here. And I'm so, I'm so curious to learn more about the programmer's brain because this is an area that I'm super interested. I mean, we both have been, we are doing the, the PhD together, right? In the same research group, uh, we were sitting in the same office and I was researching program comprehension. So how are people understanding code? And so this is so close to what really interests me, what really fascinates me. So I'm super thrilled to learn more about that. So can you tell me a little bit about the book, but also your research? Because I think the book is very close to your research that you're doing at University of Leiden, right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. And maybe we have to go one step back about what led me to write this book and what led me to, to do this research. Because initially, mm -hmm. when, exactly, we were doing the PhD at the same time. And then I wasn't so interested in program comprehension. I was more interested in developer tools at that time. But then what happened is I started to teach. And then when I started to teach, I realized that programming is so hard. I think I sort of forgot because I was already programming for such a long time for myself that all these parts of programming, like there is so much you have to get right. If you're making a program, you have to make a plan in your head, like this is where I'm going, which requires you to understand the, the domain, the problem that you're solving. But at the same time, you also have to be like ridiculously precise. You have to get periods and semicolons and brackets and everything has to fit at so many different levels that when I started to teach kids, I was like, oh my God, this is so hard. Why is this so hard? Why is it so hard, for example, for children to remember syntax? Why is it so hard for kids to remember what I was working on? And sometimes I saw kids I was very engaged in a problem and then I explained something to them. And then a few days later, it was like, oh, I have no recollection of that. And I was like, but I explained this to you like just a few days ago. How do you not remember? Or I saw them very determined of, oh, I'm making a game and the cat has to catch fish or something. This is what I'm doing. And then they sort of got sidetracked. And then you, you walk past five minutes later and I was like, weren't you making a game with a cat? And it was like, oh yeah, that's true. I totally forgot because I fell into some hole of a variable or a loop. So that just got me really, really excited to understand more about how do people think how do people remember things and of course there, there was so much research already that wasn't so connected to programming it is relatively easy to read all sorts of introduction books into cognition and cognitive science but then i realized there wasn't really a book that explains the sort of like beginner cognitive science in the context of programming so then i was like i could write that book because now i, I know a lot Oh yeah, very good. And so I actually watched one of your, your talks. I forgot where it was, but it was a really good talk about programming and understanding program. And you were also talking about kids. And when I watched that, and also when I heard your talk right now, I'm wondering, but can we actually generalize from kids to adults, right? So do we struggle the same way as kids struggle? And I definitely see like this abstraction levels, right? You have to be very detailed, as you said, with the syntax and with the semicolons or even like tabs and so on. And then you have like this, this larger vision that you have to keep in mind, but do we struggle in the same way or do adults have different problems also compared to kids? That's a great question. So in general, adults and kids do learn and struggle at the same level, but that is the case for novice adults. So if, if a 10 year old is learning to program and let's say your next door neighbor is also learning to program and they are now not a programmer, then they will very much struggle with the same thing. However, if you, if your question is about expert programmers, then they don't, then they also struggle, but they struggle in different ways. So you already know Java and now you want to learn R, then your struggle will be different than someone that doesn't know Java that is learning R, whether that's a kid or an adult. 
Okay, yeah, I see. And uh, so something else that, that I also thought when, when I heard you talk about all these different concepts and you were saying, well, an expert learns something different than like a novice or, or struggles differently. Like, for example, I'm trying to learn new programming languages, right? And so I, I know Java, I know C Sharp, I know Python and a little bit of JavaScript, but you know, the further it goes away from the languages that I initially learned, which were Java and object oriented programming, the more I'm struggling, right? So I'm struggling, I think, because I have all these preconceived ideas, mental models, notions of, you know, what's right and what's wrong, how to do that. And then sometimes I feel like, oh, this doesn't work so well now in Python, right? Yeah. <laughs> maybe this is not, I'm not meant to do it that way, right? And so how can, how can people that already know a language, how can they overcome those things? Are there some techniques that we can employ, right, to get better at learning new languages? Yeah, definitely. So one of the things that I talk about in my book is the concept of transfer. So transfer is you already know something about domain A and that helps you to learn domain B. So if you have two languages that are very close together, let's say C Sharp and Java, then you will probably experience lots of positive transfer. Like, oh, I already know this. Oh, it's exactly the same in Java. That's no issue. So that's positive transfer. But then you also have negative transfer where you assume that something works a certain way and then it doesn't. And for example, if you do object-oriented programming in Java and then you go to Python, then there's also object-oriented programming. There's also classes and methods. So maybe you're like, hmm, I know this stuff. I understand what a method is. And then suddenly stuff, of course, in Python happens at runtime. And then you're like, whoa, everything I knew was wrong. So there you have negative transfer where you might assume that you know something. And especially if you're an expert, then also you think this cannot be hard. I am already a, an expert programmer, so probably Python isn't very hard. And then it's harder than you think. And then, of course, you also run into issues of motivation where you're like, ah, I will never learn this because it's so hard. So actually, if you want to improve on transfer, there are two techniques that people typically use. And the techniques are called hugging and bridging. So hugging is where you try to get the concepts to be really close together. An example of hugging is if you already know Java, then it might be easier for you to solve a problem in Java. So first you solve the problem in Java and then you simply, it's not always simple, but simply translate your solution into, let's say, Python, if you're learning that. So that makes it easier than you're trying to get the languages closer together. And with bridging, you're deliberately looking for concepts that are the same. So you, you really set out like, like you're walking in a forest and you're like, oh, I know that bird. Oh, I know that tree. So with bridging, you're really, you try to walk around in Python and you're like, oh, a function. I know a function. What is, what is it that I already know about functions? Well, they have parameters and they might have output parameters. So you're really getting your prior knowledge that's already in your long-term memory. You're, you're fetching all the knowledge you have and with the knowledge close, you're trying to bridge the gap between the old and the new programming language. So those are concrete techniques that we know that can help make it more likely that positive transfer will happen so that you will benefit from existing knowledge. But of course, eh, this is not a magic trick. So learning a new programming language, learning something new will always remain hard. So my book doesn't really talk about motivation that much. It's really more about the, the, cognitive, the theoretical cognitive side. But yeah, you also have to be prepared to be a beginner again. You have to accept that it, even though you might have been doing Java for, for 30 years, Python will still be hard. Python will still trip you up in an unexpected way. So I don't have better news. Like these techniques I describe in my book definitely help, but they're not a magic pill. It will always be hard to learn a new programming language. I think also what's for me, for example, when I'm thinking about Python and Java, because this is a very a concrete example that I'm experiencing since years now, <laughs> is that, you know, there are also not so many resources specifically for people that, you know, have Java knowledge and want to learn Python, right? As you said, because if I'm aware of that, I could actually transfer some of the concepts and help people. So for me, it would have mean, so when I started Python, right? Well, the first thing was I actually started with Django. So I went to the Django Girls website, which is wonderful. I have to look that up and put the right link down there in the show notes. But 
And so they, they walk you through a complete web application. And that was wonderful to get me started and, you know, to give me some tools. And I was also uh, getting a lot of really quick, positive experience, right? So I was learning a lot, but I was also making progress. But then from there, it was really hard for me because when you go through a normal Python course, it was really boring and I couldn't, I couldn't drag myself through it because it's like, oh, this is a data type and this is a variable and see how we assign something to a variable. And I'm like, really, this is not a good use of my time, right? And so I think it has also a little bit to do with being more aware that there should be resources for people that have already some preconceived notions or some main models and help them to, you know, hop onto a different language. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's very true. I think there's lots of materials that are aimed at absolute beginners and you never know who might take your course. So maybe let's just explain a variable just in case. And let's just explain a loop. Um, and of course it would be like a combinatorial explosion if you had to have courses for like Python for Java programmers and C for, for Python programmers. So I, I guess it's hard to develop these things. And actually I just finished a research study where we interviewed high school teachers, high school computer science teachers, and we asked them specifically about this. And we asked them, hey, do you take into account the programming language that students already know when they come into class? And it is very, very hard and it's unlikely for various reasons. So sometimes teachers say, yeah, we, we don't have time to specifically spend effort on this. Or well, we don't really know what programming language knowledge they already have. So it's very hard to connect to prior knowledge because one kid might have done Scratch in, in elementary school and another might have already done a bit of Python. So it's definitely a recognizable problem, but sadly it's also a hard to fix problem for, for professional resources, for professional programmers, and also for kids that are learning programming in school. Yeah, well, I mean, you're definitely right that the high school, there's also one teacher, you know, and let's say, 30 students or 50 students and so on. But I think at scale in on the internet, I yeah, think it's it a be worth one it. with, with all the niches, right? So yeah. niches are, and now, now think about like the, I mean, even though there are only a few, but let's think about how many people there are that know Java and want to learn Python. And I think if you think about the internet and if you have a big distribution, like it could be really relevant. I mean, these programming resources, they're like, they're really coming out yeah. <laughs> like weed everywhere, right? <laughs> yeah. So many people that are jumping on this train to teach others to program. And I think it's maybe some niche that it's unexplored from an entrepreneurial perspective to actually make it yeah. work. I think you're definitely right that as you, your own struggle is a very recognizable struggle for many people where beginner resources are too slow and boring, but then mm -hmm. you're also not Python ready enough to just start exactly. to build something after an intro like Django Girls, something like that hasn't prepared you enough to be a professional Python programmer. So yeah, I think you might be right that there's a, like a market gap there that someone could fill. So in your book, you also talk about reading and understanding code. So not only learning and reading, I mean, reading is one of the things like 60% there are a couple of studies that show that almost 60% or over 60% of our daily work is on reading and understanding code. So how can we get better at that? What are some of the concepts that or things that we have to learn to get better at reading and understanding code? Yeah, what I describe in my book is three different types of reading code, because I think that as programmers, we don't really read code that much. And that also means we don't have good strategies for reading code. Like if you have to start a project and you probably know a bunch of strategies, like how am I starting a project? Maybe I'm starting with tests or I'm really doing a small, minimal viable project. You have some strategies and for reading code, sometimes I want to use a certain library and I go to the GitHub page of the library and, and I sort of skim their code to see what they do because of course they don't have a readme or it's outdated or it's ununderstandable to me. So you skim the code and like, how do I do that? Do I start at the top like it's a book or do I start somewhere looking for a main method and then, then look what it refers to? These are of course both things that people do, but we don't really have good strategies. And then very quickly people are like, oh, code reading is hard. Other people are bad at writing code. It will be just easier for me if I write this library from scratch because it's so hard to understand code. So the book offers a number of different strategies that you can use to read code. And as I said, I distinguish three different types of code reading that are associated with three different cognitive processes. So firstly, 
you have your long-term memory that has all your memories and also programming related memories and also syntax of programs. So sometimes you're reading a specific code and the example I give in the book is an a, a programming APL. That's a sort of an oblique programming language that nobody knows. And if I give you an APL problem, your problem will be a long-term memory problem because you don't know the keywords of APL because the keywords of APL are omega and Tauta, and even they have a keyword that looks like an angry face. It's very weird. So your problem is a long-term memory problem, which you can also sometimes have in Java. Sometimes in Java, there can be a, a Java built-in method that you don't recognize. So that's a specific long-term memory problem. And if you're aware that, oh, this code is confusing because I just don't have enough knowledge, you can specifically go look for that knowledge. Another issue that you can have is a short-term memory issue. So your short-term memory, as people might be aware of, is very, very, very small. So you can only remember sort of like, let's say around five things at the same time. So if code forces you to remember more than five things, then your brain gets full and then you're just lost. So if you, for example, have a, a method with many parameters or a function, you have to remember the function name and then you have to look up in the code search Oh, where's the function defined? Oh, and then you have to remember the actual parameters and then the defined parameters. And then your brain just gets full and you cannot remember everything. You cannot get it in your short-term memory. Then of course, it's also very hard to understand the code. So that's a different type of problem that will also have a different type of solution. If you don't know a keyword, you have to Google the keywords. But if you cannot remember everything, you maybe have to get a sheet of paper and write down the information that you're lacking. So that's really a, a problem of information. And then there's a third type of confusion, and that's confusion that's related to the working memory. So if you think of uh, my example in the book is a basic program, if you think of a program that's a heavily imperative program, then maybe there are just three or four variables. So you can remember them and maybe it's just multiplying and dividing and looping. So you do know what's going on, but still the code is hard. And that might be because you have a working memory problem because, and this happens, I often say, this is when you have to use the strategy of the finger. So once you take your finger on the screen and you start reading like, oh, hey, oh this is this variable, this is this variable, then it's very likely that you're, you have a working memory problem. You have the information, you have the knowledge, but it's still puzzling together what is going, going wrong. So I think once we understand these three different memory processes and the three different types of confusion that you can experience while reading code, you also see that there are three different solutions. And then, you know, as, as with learning a new programming language, it will always be hard to read code that's made by someone else or made by you a long time ago. It will, it will never be very easy. But once you recognize what type of confusion you're experiencing, at least you might be a little bit closer to the solution. Yeah, what, what would be one solution? Let's say, for example, if I have the processing problem, right? So that my processing power is not <laughs> high enough. What can I do? Yeah, that's a great question. So some of the techniques I describe in the book is, for example, making a state table. So I know this sounds really silly and a bit like you're back in school, but it really works if you make a table on paper, or you can also do it in a spreadsheet, it doesn't really matter. You make a list of all the variables that are in the program, and then you write down, let's say you're doing a loop. So on the first iteration of the loop, what are all the values of the variables? And then on the next iteration of the loop, what are all the values of the variables? And that can give you some information. For example, there might be something that acts as a counter that, that goes up. And sometimes these things are so disguised that it's, it's not for I in range five. It's very hard to see which is going up and which is going down and which of the variables are doing list access. And sometimes before you can make such a state table, it can be really nice to visualize the dependencies in the code. And for that, I really like to make a screenshot of code and print it out as a PDF, or you can also put it on your iPad. And I just link, I circle all the variables and I draw links between all the variables. Okay, this variable, where does it go? This variable, where does it go? And then once you have sort of a mental model of what is connected to what, you can step through the code and really make a table of what are the values. And that can be really helpful in understanding what is going on. For me, this sounds very much like debugging, 
like how I debug code, right? And there was actually, I, I forgot how it was called years ago, but when I was working at the University of Victoria with Margaret and Story, there they had like a tool that helped you explore different programs, right? And so the idea was that, well, if I want to understand how this program works, then I think it was driver or something like this. This was the, the research tool that they developed. And so this driver was helping you step-by-step step go through the code, right? So you were actually running the code in order to understand the code and, and it's a little bit like debugging, but that it had more output, right? And you were not really looking for problem or the, finding the debug that you have right now, but really understanding the code. So you were executing it. Something else that came to my mind is like uh, tests. I think tests very often help with that, right? So you have like a test um, method and it tells you a little bit how you know, it tells you because it's testing something in a, a small unit of how it works, and then you could actually run the test and you can also step-by-step step debug the test. So this is what I'm doing, for example, quite often if I'm not understanding something or want to get familiar again with, with the code part of the system or code base that I'm not familiar anymore. What do you think about this? Instead of, you know, having your finger in some paper, really using the tools that we have in our IDE, for example, debuggers and so on. Yeah, so those are definitely great tools that you can use. And often they can be used in combination with each other. So a debugger can also give the most recent value of a variable. But often case, debuggers don't show all the previous values. So you don't get this nice table of relationships. So if you have a debugger, you can definitely use it to, to make all the, to understand all the val values of one iteration. And then you do another iteration and you still write it down. So I think these, these, tasks or these tools nicely complement each other. And also for a test, yeah, you might be curious, oh, what happens if this list is empty? You, you can do this mentally, but if there is a test that allows you to run the code with, let's say no customers or something, no one is locked in, what happens then? Yeah, then the test can really help you also build the mental model. So the reason in that my book mainly describes methods that you can do on paper rather than on the computer is because I thought, debuggers and testing, this is what people already know. These are tools and my book is aimed at professional programmers. They will use tests, they will use the debuggers. So these are tools that they are familiar with. So here and there, of course, in the book, we refer to that, but the book was really main, meant to give people new strategies that they haven't tried out. And then of course, like if you have a actual toolbox with tools, sometimes a hammer and a, a nail is better. And sometimes a screw and a screwdriver is better. If you, if you have a large vocabulary of tools, then as a professional, you can decide which tool makes sense in which, which context. And so one of the topics, my favorite topic is code reviews. <laughs> and so here we also have to understand, read code, right? And, and give suggestions also, really understand not only what the code does, but also is the code correct so on so many different levels. Again, we are assessing the code and definitely in a good understanding of what's going on here is the first step. And I find that a lot of people are struggling with that, right? And so there are several there's several issues to that. One is that very often code review tools that we have nowadays, yeah, tooling that allows you to do the code reviews, do not show you the whole code, right? So they just show you snippets, for example. This is really a difficult thing, right? But then also it's code maybe that you are unfamiliar with, maybe you don't know the code base. What are your ideas about code reviews and how can we make them you know, better? How can we decrease the cognitive load? And yeah, how can we get the most out of it? Yeah, so I do think that the, the three different forms of confusion that I describe in my book can also be helpful in code reviews. So what I really hope is that people won't just read the book individually, but also like you can buy one copy and then read it with your whole team. Because I think the different forms of confusion give a vocabulary. If you are in a code review, I've, of course, often people will say, hey, I find this code confusing. And that's sort of fair. Right? If you find the code confusing, then, then that's what, what you think. That, that it's not an unfair comment, but it's not helpful for the person that has written the code. Okay, you find it confusing. Why? And then in my experience, people find it really hard to vocalize why code is confusing. And if you have these three different modes, and at least you can say, oh, this code is confusing because I don't know this keyword. 
And that's not the, the author's fault that you don't know a certain keyword or, or a certain language con construct in Python. For example, list comprehensions. You might just not be aware of list, list comprehensions, for example, if you're coming from Java. So that's not really a problem of the author. That's, that's more a problem of the reader that the reader can fix by just learning a concept. So once they can vocalize, this goes in confusing because, hey, I don't understand what that, that list thing is doing then the solution can be, I explain that to my teammates and then the code is no longer confusing without a change to the code. Whereas if a, a certain piece of code requires lots of processing power, then maybe as an author, you can change that. And we have some, some techniques in the book as, book as well, but people might already be familiar with techniques like eh, giving stuff better names, uh, refactoring a large piece of code into different steps. So if the issue is processing power, then there might be something that the author could do or wants to do that is going to make the code better. So I think these different modes of confusion and just the notion of cognitive load that sometimes your brain takes lots of processing power because it lacks certain understanding. I, I think that might also smooth code reviews. It, it's really the book is not meant only to be help for the individual programmer, but also very much meant to set a common vocabulary. Like if, if more programmers would know the difference between working memory and short-term memory and long-term memory, then I guess they could also understand their own confusion better, but also understand why other people find their code, which they think is so beautifully documented and so well-structured. It might still be very confusing. If you bring me a fantastic poem in, in German, then I will never see the beauty. I know some words. Yeah? It's not that I don't understand any German. I can like order a coffee or something. And you might be totally crazy about this poem. Like, look, Felina, look how fantastic it is. A and I will never join you. And that's not the poem's problem. That's just because I don't know enough words and grammatical structures to really see what's there. So I think that that difference might help people also have more smoother code review. Yeah, I think a uh, common vocabulary, not only about, you know, the processing power, but in general, like also shared uh, engineering values are really, really important, right? And this brings me to readable code because maybe I'm a junior or maybe I'm unfamiliar with this framework or with this API, right? So I'm, as you said, I'm having some lack of knowledge here and this is why it's confusing, but it could also be that the code itself is, as you said, a little bit unreadable and so on. And I think it's really important that teams develop their own or as a team right a coherent engineering value what is readable code for us what is what are we valuing like high quality means for us this and that right so and i'm working with this startup right now and we're building their engineering team and so one of the first thing that we worked on is our engineering values so whenever we are hiring and when we are getting new team members that we are all on board and this is a living document right so we change it and you know when somebody is coming in we can reflect on those engineering values again and think like what is high quality code what means that our code is good tested or testable you know maintainable and so on and i think this is really important for code reviews as well and, and, and also for understanding the code of others, because it helps us to see. And this is something I, I read the first two parts of your book that are already available on, on the website. And so what I really found interesting was that readable code is code, for example, that has design patterns or follows design patterns. And it has to do, and now I have to explain that. I will explain it and you can then correct it. <laughs> yeah, it's really it's great to way, hear right? what other people take away if you write something. Yeah. So please I, I really go like ahead. That part. Yes, I like that part because it said, well, readable code, right? Or code that's easier to process is code that follows design patterns if and only if the person that reads this knows design patterns because then they're taking those patterns, right? These parts of the code from their long-term memory. So this frees up short-term memory and frees up processing power. So they can actually understand the code quicker. But what I also took away from that is that, that well, design patterns, okay. Design, but everything that we know, right? So that we can recognize whenever we have as a, as a team, if we have a good structure and we know this is where, you know, those files are, right? Or we are structuring our classes in that way. All of that is a very similar concept. I think we can transfer and generalize that from the design patterns and go away and say, well, if we know where to put those artifacts and uh, people can expect something, they will also over time, you know, be better in understanding and processing our code. 
So this is what I took away and I thought, this is really great. I will put that into my code review workshops because I think it's really helpful. And this is also where I think coherence, that, that the power of a coherent code base comes from, right? So that we have coherent coding practices, uh, coding style, because this really frees our memory our yeah freeze our processing power so that we can really try to understand okay what is this algorithm doing and not you know where can i find different methods and and variables and so on yeah i, I think that's a great takeaway and if you like that part there will be lots of more in the book in the rest of the book that we can talk about now already a little bit so the process that you're describing here indeed is called chunking and that means that if you group similar information together then rather than remembering it as similar information then you can remember it at one go for example if i if i ask you to remember cat dog donkey that's a lot easier to remember than salt roof microphone because those words have nothing to do with each other, all, only they're in my view right now. And it's easier to remember three things that are similar than three things that have nothing to do with each other. Because with the first one, you think, oh, oh these are all animals. You might already anticipate if I say cat, that the, the next thing could be dog. The same is true indeed for code. So if you look at code that has, let's say, the singleton pattern, you look at the code and you can just say, oh, that has a singleton pattern. And you can remember, oh, and the singleton is this one thing, like a token, for example, that can only be given out once. Whereas if the code is sort of all over the place and doesn't specifically use a design pattern, then you cannot at one go remember it. You have to remember individual lines or variables or class names. And remember, your, your short-term memory is really limited. So if two or three or four things are in there, then it's full. And as you exactly said, it frees up some mental space. If you can just say singleton pattern token, then you have two things in your brain. Whereas if you have to remember, oh, one variable is created. Oh, if you try to instantiate it again, you get an error. Then you have to remember many different things at the same time. And, and you're right that, that that really goes beyond design patterns. Some other examples that we have later in the book uh, are, for example, about variable names. There's this really nice new paper that came out that talks about the concept of name molds. Like, how do you form a name? Let's say you have to make a name for the maximum value. What do you use? Do you say maximum value or max value or value max or value maximum or maximum of values? There are so many different ways in which you can do this. And this paper that I describe in my book describes an experiment in which they asked people to just came up with, with names for such a situation. And you see, indeed, developers are all over the place. But if you teach them to use a specific three-step technique, then they get a lot better at, at making the same type of names. And then your code gets easier because if you're looking for a variable, then you know what to look for. If it's always maximum and then the entity, you know that all the maximums will be in the beginning. You have to look for the entities in the end or the other way around. It seems like there's not a big difference between different molds, but quote gets really confusing if different people use different molds. So again, also variable molds are not naming name molds are another example of if you make it easy for people to process code then they will process it with ease but if you make it hard by having max value but then interest maximum it just gets harder and it's it's unnecessary complexity we also talk about that in the book you just said cognitive load you have the difference between intrinsic cognitive load and extraneous cognitive load. So intrinsic cognitive load is this problem is hard. It's really hard to do this and this uh, SSL algorithm or something. But extraneous cognitive load is like having maximum interest and value maximum. Just for no good reason, mixing up different name molds is going to add to your cognitive load, but it's not going to help you in any way it's just the like extra low extra fluff that you have to process so i think that's also another concept in which chunking that we describe in the book occurs at at many different level at a quite high level of design pattern but also at a really low level of choosing a variable name yeah and i think what's really valuable here is that we have some way where we take that a little bit out of this oh this is subjective right <laughs> i can do yes. whatever i want right so yes. um readability i mean the whole readability um area sometimes gets very very loaded because there are some people that understand that it matters and then there are a lot of people that hold 
against it and say, well, it doesn't matter because it's objective, right? Whatever I want, I can do. Yeah. Um, it's the same for the compiler. <laughs> yeah, or, or even that they might argue that my method is better because, whereas yeah. it doesn't really matter even. Yeah, exactly, right? And so I think uh, having more research in that area and really understanding, uh, give us a better understanding of, you know, where is some merit to making it more coherent and making it more, you know, easier and where there's really, it doesn't matter. Right? Yeah. So I think that that's really, that's really, that's really good. And, and the happy so, news is that other yeah. research also shows, which I think is really nice, is once you choose a specific way of doing stuff, then people tend to stick with it. So people aren't as, you know, oh, I know better than, than you might think. So if your team has a way of choosing variable names, for example, it's likely that people new to the code base without you really saying, oh, welcome to our code base, this is how we do names, that people will just pick it up like automatically if you are if you are deliberate about it. But of course, if you are all over the place and people don't have any method to, to click to, so then, yeah, then they will just do whatever, whatever they feel is better. So a little investment might actually result in a more consistent code base that keeps going without any effort. Yeah, and I think, I mean, everybody will be happy because choosing name is hard and yes. it's annoying and I hate it. Like every time, like I, I love programming, but then choosing my names from my variables and my methods is like, oh, what should I pick? Yeah, <laughs> no exactly. Idea. So if and you so have having, this method, yeah. then it's right? also, it's, it's just low effort for you while writing exactly. code. It's like a pattern. It's like an algorithm that you can take and you can just generate your methods and your names out of it. And it's, I think that would be it. It's, that's great. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, so that so, would be uh, chapter, uh, chapter nine of the book, uh, probably how nine. it uh, yeah. comes out. So you have to wait a little bit before that comes out. You know what, what I'm waiting for, for the chapter about complex code. <laughs> can you explain what is complex code and how can we be get better in maybe not writing complex code or <laughs> <laughs> reading complex code? Yeah, definitely. So the, the chapter about complex codes has a number of techniques that come from natural language reading. Because often, of course, we say, oh, programming is like math, right? Like mathematics. But new research, last year, a paper was published in Nature, which is like one of the top journals for researchers, that said that actually how well you can program is very much correlated with how well you can do natural language and less so correlated with your mathematical ability. Which, of course, if you think about it, it makes all the sense in the world. It's a programming language and 70% and, and or something of tokens in a program will be natural language because you have keywords and variables. So there's some sense to that. So that, that led me to the idea that is present in most, most of my research that, hey, maybe we can learn from how natural language does stuff. So maybe you remember that if you were in, uh, when you were in high school, you had to look at nonfiction texts very often for, for German or English or Dutch. And they ask you a question like, hey, here's a newspaper article. What are the five biggest, most important lines? Or, hey, here's a newspaper article. First, don't read it. Just look at the paper, the, the images, or just look at the structure, look at the headlines, or look at it for three minutes and, and see what you still remember, or write a summary. These are all well-established ways to deal with nonfiction texts. And all these strategies can also be applied to code. So these strategies, these are, these are the exercises we have in the book where we, we ask you to look at code for two seconds or, or a minute or something. Just look at the code, glance at it. And what is the first thing you see? What have you learned from just glancing at the code? So that is a way that you can deal with, with com complex code. Look at the code for five minutes and try your best to write a summary. And of course, what, what you take away says a lot about your prior knowledge. If I have to, I don't really know R. So if I had to look at an R program, probably I will take away something different than if I look at a Python program. So it tells you something about your own level of ability, but clearly it also tells you something about the code. So these are all techniques that you can try. As I said, it's just filling a toolbox that you can try to help you read more complex code. And it will always be hard. But if, you, if your only strategy is read the code, oh, I don't understand, oh, read it again. Then, then you're not really going to advance. So all these techniques we know that really support nonfiction reading of text are probably also likely in different, different situations to help you with reading code. 
Wow, I'm so looking forward to that. Like, cool. <laughs> actually, I was reading your book by re using a screen reader. I and saw then, on Twitter. That's yeah, so cool. I, and it was really cool. Like, I was reading, like, the screen reader was reading the book and I was reading at the same time. And I actually experimented a little bit with two different screen readers. Like, one was really highlighting the, the sentences and the words, which was very different for me to process the the book because I was reading at the same time the same thing that she said and so it somehow um, hit my brain like in two ways and then the other but this was a very annoying screen reader which also read a lot of other things so then I switched and here I really had to find and so what, what I did I was like just glancing over the parts and was listening to it and could also take notes and everything but I felt that it was very my attention and what I could take out of it was really enhanced. So I will I will continue doing that. Anyway, so I'm really looking forward to, to read more of your book. I, one thing that I wanted to ask you, uh, maybe as a last question, is a little bit about the process of writing your book. I'm also writing a book and I probably have a very different <laughs> <laughs> process that you have, but how are you doing it? How do you come up with the chapters? How do you come up with these uh, different exercises? How do you know what, what the readers really want to know? Yeah, I think I sort of cheated a bit because I was already giving a master's course at Leiden called Psychology of Programming. And I've been, I gave that course already four times to different groups of students. And the book is sort of my lecture notes. So the exercises are things I have tried out in class with students. And the storyline is more or less the storyline that I use in the course. So clearly that helped a lot because I already had this storyline and I had already read all those papers because I discussed them in class with students so so that was like the beginning of the process was i had a plan of course the book turned out really different from the lecture notes for various reasons because once you start writing stuff on paper you also have to be precise in a really different way so in lecture i can just say oh it's more or less this and you can read the paper that's your homework by and now of course, <laughs> you have to you have to be really you have to really understand at a different if you're covering a paper in a book you have to understand at a different level, like what exactly was the experiment. In a, in a class, you can say, oh, for example, I have this part about camel case versus snake case. You can just say, oh, camel case is better for comprehension, but snake case is quicker. That's the result of the paper. That's, that's exactly what it says. But of course, in a book, you have to say, oh, what, how many people participated in the study and exactly what was there? So, And then you start diving in deeper and then it makes you reflect at a different level. So clearly many changes were made. But my, my biggest process was, was cheating by giving a course about really the same topics for a bunch of years and then writing everything down in detail. And so really the last question now, <laughs> no, wait, not a last question, but <laughs> one, 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 so, more. <laughs> <laughs> one more, why did you choose uh, to go with a publisher uh, and not self-publish your book? Like nowadays, everybody self-publishes books, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, I think there's a, a variety of reasons. Firstly, it just looks I think better on your resume to have a published book. I think my promotion committee will be more impressed by me having a published book on my name, especially by like an established author in your field. That's going to be stronger than, hey, I, I put a PDF on the internet. So, so that, that's definitely one reason. Uh, and another reason is also that, of course, yeah, I, I pay m most of what I make to the publisher and there's not a lot left for me. But it is uh, worth it, I think, in terms of making the book better. So I got two editors, both a development editor and also a technical editor that, that, that was representing um, the goal audience. And the technical, the first the development editor was like, oh, this is, I, I wrote a scientific lecture notes, right? She's like, oh, this is way too theoretical and you have to really dress up the theory with a sugar coat layer because it's for professionals and of course first I was like yeah eh. of course a professional can read a little bit about science but yeah you have to make it relevant for for the daily pra practitioner or they won't read it so those two editors just really make the book a lot better even though the process was less fun because just writing a pdf and putting it on leanpub is easy so i was at one well, and a few times of course it is like this i'm sure it's like this for your book as well sometimes you're like oh this is going well and then you're like oh i will never finish this so the process was harder because i had to really rethink okay wh why is it valuable for people to know this and of course it's really different if students they enter your lecture hall in pre corona of course uh, they will not leave in the middle of lecture. That's very unlikely. 
So you can first build up all the theory and then the last 10 minutes talk about why this is relevant because they are, they are in, your, in your power. They're not leaving. Whereas, of course, in a book, I realized after I failed a few chapters <laughs> that you cannot do 17 pages of theory and then explain why it's relevant. That just that structure doesn't work for practitioners. And I don't think I would have really made that realization myself without the development editor really used to, to selling books to practitioners. And then finally, also in terms of marketing, of course, then it really, it really helps. Of course, I track my sales and I have a link, like my own link and a link from the publisher. And, and you do see that they are reaching an audience that I'm not reaching and they, they are bringing sales, which is not only nice because, you know, it would be nice if I make a, a, a bit of money out of the book. But also, of course, what I want is that people know this little bit of cognitive science because I really truly believe that it's just going to make them better and happier programmers. So that's another reason that I, even though I have quite a following on social media, you do see that, that the publisher is better able to sell books to to my target audience than than I would be myself. So so those those were my reasons. Yeah, I think they're all valid reasons. Uh, all things that are also going through my head. I haven't made the decision yet. I'm also writing the book together, so it's a it's a collaborative decision. And we're always like, oh, let's do it this way. Oh, let's do it the other way. But I think we still have some time to decide what we're going to. Yeah, do and it's hard. And, it, so, and and in any case, I would definitely recommend to, to, to ask for feedback very early. If I, if I can give you, you and other people in the audience, maybe that are considering writing a book. And my first reader was the technical development editor of the, of the publisher, which was helpful because she slayed everything, as I said, because I had much too much theory in the beginning. But in retrospect, that they didn't have to be the case, right? You know, most of my fr friends are programmers. So I could have asked other people for a little bit of feedback that I, that I trust and like, not on the entire book, of course, but just some examples and do they make sense? And what do you think of this order? I definitely made the mistake that's maybe common to people that are experts in something. I was like, I wrote a PhD thesis. I know how to write a book. And so it wasn't the same. So I thought I knew how to do it and then I didn't. So. If you go with self-publishing or with a publisher, it doesn't matter, but definitely reach out to all your friends and followers on Twitter for some draft reading that it will be nicer than uh, waiting until the end and then having to overhaul everything. Yeah. Yeah. I think that are great last words for this episode. I, I'm so happy that you have been on my show, Feline, talking, talking with me about all these ideas on how to learn program, how to understand code. I would love to talk again. Maybe I'm inviting you again to deep dive into some other areas and yeah, uh, maybe something, maybe one last thing that you want to tell my listeners and then uh, I let you go. Yeah, I think I said it a bunch of times, but I'll say it again. Like learning something new is really, really hard. So cut yourself a bit of slack. Like even if you know everything about Java, Python will still be hard. And even if you're an expert Python programmer, reading a Python program that you've never seen before by someone else, it will always be hard. So remember that you are an expert in one thing, but you're still a beginner in something else. So take time and patience and use the tools you have and specifically reach out for tools because don't make the mistake maybe like i did with my book thinking oh this will be easy because i did it once every new beginning is still hard and that's okay that's like the way it is you will not get smarter than you already are the only thing you can still learn is new knowledge in a different field yeah thank you so much so thank you feline for being on my show thank you so much yeah, it was really nice to be on the show. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed another episode of the Soft Engineering Unlocked podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll talk to you again in two weeks. Bye.